yesterday we were talking about the diverging of elite cultural opinion and ordinary people cultural opinion. This is, if you're the type of person, it's insulting as hell. He pretty much, there was a four minute song making fun of the Catholic Church and Irish people from top to bottom, start to finish, back to front. It makes fun of the Pope, it makes fun of the Church, it makes fun of Cardinals, and everything. Monty Python is a group, nothing sacred. He's, he's going to make fun of everything. If you're the type of, believe me, and a lot of people watch that, and said, that is the most offensive, insulting thing. Write a letter to the newspaper. Dear, new, dear newspaper, I can't believe these Monty Python people, they are making... That, I, if you're pissed off by that, that identifies you as one of the backward, non-edgy, non-hip, non-cool, boring people. On the other hand, if you find that funny, in Britain in the 1960s and 1970s, that identifies you as one of the cool people, one of the hip people, the modern people, the people who, you know, can appreciate, you know, laughing at things like this. It goes to that divergence between elite opinion and kind of ordinary opinion. We're, and we started with this dichotomy yesterday. What we're going to talk about today is what's known as the lost generation. The lost generation is a group of artists and writers citizens of the state of Tennessee said that in the state of Tennessee, evolution as a theory, Darwin's theory of evolution, will not be taught in Tennessee's public high schools. That in Tennessee, we believe that, you know, that the theory of evolution is an assault on Christian belief. That if we are going to say that man came from the ape, then there's nothing special about man and he cannot be made in God's image. And we're not willing to go down that road that man is just some, you know, animal with nothing sacred about him. And the state of Tennessee said, look, you can learn about evolution in the library, you can learn about evolution on your own, you can learn about evolution, but you're not going to be taught it by employees of the Tennessee Department of Education. And as soon as they passed these laws, a group of progressives, you know, swooped, swooped down and sued and purposely violated the law so they could have a trial, so they could turn this trial into a circus. They picked the smallest little town in Tennessee they could find. And when the trial started, all of the elite, you know, newspaper publishers and writers descended on this tiny little town in Tennessee and spent the next three months making fun of the rednecks. Look how backward they are. That's the progressive mind with all of its good and its bad. The progressives pretty much said, who should not be in charge of what gets taught in the school classrooms of Tennessee? Um, tradition. Specifically, if you attack that law, what are you attacking? No, you're not attacking religious people. 
Who, who determines what gets taught in the classrooms of Tennessee? Board of Education. What? Board of Education. Which is elected by? The citizens of Tennessee. But this is a state law. The state legislature of Tennessee says you will not teach evolution in these schools. That state legislature is elected by whom? The, state. The, the people in Tennessee. So when the Scopes Monkey Trial people descend on this little town, what are they saying? That who should not be in charge of education in Tennessee? The people, the people of Tennessee. Tennessee. Who should be in charge of it? The religious people. No, you're missing this entirely. No, you, you're done. We're, we're starting over. Okay. The techno, techno man. Stop, we're starting over. All right. Who sets education policy in the state of New Jersey? Board of Education. The, what Board of Education? The, the, board of education. the New Jersey Board of Education. There's a New Jersey Board of Education. Okay, there's a supervisor that it's a state government thing, okay? That what the curriculum of the state of New Jersey is written by the state of New Jersey, okay? The Board of Education, and the state legislature has sovereignty over that, okay? How does the state legislature get there? They're voted in by people, Ordinary, you know? When you go to cast your vote, you vote for state senators and state representatives, state assemblymen of New Jersey. Same thing goes for Tennessee. In the state of Tennessee, the duly elected legislature passed a law that said the, the Darwin's theory of evolution will not be taught in public schools in Tennessee. The duly elected governor of Tennessee signed that law and it became the law. And then someone decided, a progressive decided, that they were going to purposely break this law and have to go to trial. And then that's when the circus began. So if you want to reject that law, Barbara said up, if you want to reject that law, who in the end are you rejecting? Of the citizens of Tennessee. Who are you saying should not be making education laws for the state, the children of Tennessee? Of Tennessee. And who should, in fact, be making them? The progressives, them. They're, that's pretty much what you're saying is if you let a bunch of hick rednecks make the laws to educate their own children, what are you going to get? A bunch of young hick rednecks. And if we want to progress society, we have got to take that power away from the people of Tennessee and who should determine what gets taught in Tennessee's classroom. We should. We progressives. We scientific, advanced-minded, smart people from really good colleges. We should be the ones deciding what people learn in Tennessee, not the citizens of the state of Tennessee. And that story shows, you know, in a nutshell, all the good and bad of the progressive movement. It's desire. Look, you know. We should teach kids, like, you know, the latest science. You know, it's good to be, you know, have a scientific education. But the downside is we're going to impose this from on high and reject your authority over your own children. That's progressivism in a nutshell. We know what's best. Listen to us. We know what's best for you. We will socially engineer society to improve it, to progress it. That sounds scary. The lost generation is related to this. And let's get back to this idea. I have no idea how else I'm going to have a purple part of the pen, but that's cool. What's the word alienated? What's the root of this word here? Alien. alien. What's an alien? Foreign. Someone from somewhere else. It can be from the planet Venus, or it can be just a foreigner. Just alien is a synonym for foreigner. That you looked at the Alien and Sedition Acts. John Adams was not legislating against little green men from Mars. He's legislating against people in the United States who are not American citizens. Alien. 
to be alienated from something, then what do you think that means? I, uh, away, secluded, apart from. If you are alienated from your parents, that means that you there's something in between. You something horrible happened, and now you don't have a relationship with your parents. If you are alienated from guys, start going out with a girl, and they you know forget about their friends. This happens all the time. This is why guys have these little you know. Dicks before chicks, man. Rose before hoes. Why? Why do guys need lines like dicks before chicks and rose before hoes? Because what are guys doing? Forgetting about the guys. They're forgetting about their friends. They're so smitten with the lovely new girlfriend. They're alienated from their friends. A, a wall, an invisible wall has grown up. Sometimes that invisible girl has a name. <laughs> if you are alienated from your own culture, that means that you are sitting apart from your own culture, pretty much throwing rhetorical bombs at it. The Lost Generation is a group of artists and writers alienated from Western culture, generally, and American culture specifically, who are highly critical of it. Now, before we move on, we need to understand that there's always been people critical of the United States in the United States. What is abolitionism, you know, if not a movement of people critical of something about the United States? But we need to draw a difference. We need to draw a difference between people who are critical because you truly want something to improve. What's there is good, I'll make it better. That's abolitionism, for example, okay? The United States is good, we just need to make it better as opposed to someone so alienated that they look at their own culture and say, it's not getting better until we completely destroy what's there now. Okay? There's, a bit, there's different types of criticism. You know? People who say, oh, you know... And with people we love, we need to be very careful with our criticism. People we don't care about, we can throw rhetorical bombs at all day long because we don't care about them. Sorry. Yes, they, that's why it's called the lost generation because they they don't have a. If you're lost, you don't have a a home. That's exactly why it's this name. They're I mean they're metaphysically meta, metaphysically lost. They don't know where their home base is, where to drop anchor, where to hang your hat. And so, what you start to get from American elites is criticism, but not criticism that's constructive, really, but criticism that says the whole shit show's got to go before it can be made better. Not, it's pretty good now and we'll make it better, but the whole thing needs to be torn down and start it over from scratch. That's that utopianism that we talked about yesterday. Do what I think and we will have a perfect future. So for the first time in American history, really, you're going to start to see some pretty vitriolic attacks on some pretty fundamental, foundational American institutions. Like what? Church. Church and religion. We're going to start to attack the church and religion. Not the church can be fixed, the church can be improved, we need a third great awakening. The problem is religion itself. Bunch of superstitious morons running around thinking there's some god in the sky who cares what they do. What else? Government. I mean, okay. American government. Who here has read, and I'm sure many of you, who's read Scarlet Letter and the Crucible? What's the purpose of Scarlet Letter and the Crucible? <laughs> really? No. It's because they're talking, I mean, in the Crucible, they're talking about how, like, the government, 
um, the judges and all those things are being like tricked by little girls. All right, so it's an attack on authority. What is the point? You can look at it that way. We should learn from the past. But how else is it seen? The people who are different are alienated from their whole society. I'm not, I'm not looking for a summary of Scarlet Letter. Okay? What is Scarlet Letter attacking? What? No, it's not attacking adultery. What is Scarlet Letter? Scarlet Letter is attacking Puritan New England. Right? The whole book is an attack on Puritanism. Is it not? Was there one single Puritan character that would be real kind of Puritan, that was a positive character in that book? All the judges, all the ministers, all the people of authority in Salem and in Massachusetts in general are what? Close-minded, Close awful, evil, etc., etc., etc. It's Crucible and Scarlet Letter are that in the Crucible. The same people, look, we can look at the Puritans, you know, these are the people that fled England, you know, they were persecuted religiously, they came to the New World for opportunity and freedom, and they established, you know, this colony in Massachusetts where, you know, people voted and people had, you know, they lived a life according to, you know, their lights and God and all the, that the Puritans in American history were characters that were celebrated. And now works like this, by authors like these, what they do is they, they tear that down. They say that, that's a load of crap. The Puritans were really these closed-minded, awful sexes, blah, blah, blah. And I'm not saying right, wrong, or anything. I don't care. You know, for the purposes of crap. But my point is that these this lost generation, these elite writers, alienated from their own are for the first time, and we can say it's good or bad, I don't care. But it, 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 it is that we are attacking kind of the foundational characters of American history. That's different. I... What else? Anyone here read um, Death of a Salesman? Willie Lowman, the play, yeah. Who's read Death of a Salesman? Who was, right, I'll ask the question differently. Who was supposed to have read Death of a Salesman? Maybe we can ask the question now. Like, no, you, no, mean, no. you mean the, like, the skit the that they did for yeah. drama? Yeah. Because we did that. Well, that, uh, I'm sure it's not the whole play. It's yeah. an excerpt from what, what scene is it? It's a scene where he's talking about how he, he's talking to his brother. Yeah. And that he's like, they came back from the, uh, what's it called? From the Midwest, that he was on the farms and stuff, and that now he now he's becoming a businessman in like. You know, so it's the, from the beginning. Of the book. Yeah. Okay. When he comes back to like Molly or Molly's like that. Okay. <laughs> Who's either read or seen Great Gatsby? What's Great Gatsby about? Fundamentally, Great Gatsby is an assault on American materialism. Great Gatsby portrays these characters hollowed out and destroyed by their own wealth. Are any of the characters in Great Gatsby good characters? But what happens to Nick? Yeah, Nick's got all these issues going on. And the world that Nick wants to inhabit, do we, is, is that a good world? No. So Nick's not Nick is blinded by his own ambition for this material wealth. It's an attack on American material wealth. Uh, death of a salesman is an attack on the American dream. Oh yeah, it is. He is on the horses. Yeah, of course. That you know, Willie Loman, you know, wants you know success. He wants to be useful to his family. 
You know, he wants to be like a popular and well-respected salesman. And what does Willie Loman do at the end of the play? Anyone know? Kills himself. Because he's not. Anyone see Streetcar Named Desire? No. Don't. You'll, it'll, you'll want to like slit your wrists. Mm. It's by the same guy. I know some of you are reading Glass Menagerie. Yeah. Yeah. I love Glass, great. Glass, Glass Menagerie is awesome. Streetcar Named Desire is great, but it's by the same author. Like, if you want to go see a play that will make you walk out and say, human beings are awful and I want to go kill myself, Streetcar Named Desire is a great play for you. Streetcar Named Desire. A Streetcar Named Desire. Like, there's not a single positive character in the entire play. Street, just like that, Streetcar Named Desire. Yeah, Streetcar Named Desire. There's movies, you can go, you know, watch the movie Streetcar Named Desire. I've seen it, on, I've seen it staged. By like you, by Tennessee Williams. <laughs> and what, so, what elite culture is starting to do is chip away because who makes culture? It's not the ordinary person, you know, with the job and the hat. The elites make culture. And this is going to start to be the culture that elites make. This highly critical, difficult look at who we are. Now, is there some truth in all of these things? Absolutely. But that's where the difference between criticism out of love and criticism out of attack comes in. And that's kind of where the difference is. That's of any, I think here's the big ones. Anyone have any questions? Mm -hmm. Kind of on that. Um, questions, thoughts, concerns, beliefs. Mm -hmm. Wait, what was the name of the other thing you said? Which one? Uh, you said a streetcar named Street Desire. Street Desire. What was a good one? Uh, glass and Asher. I, 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 I like Glass and Asher. It's okay. Yeah, okay. Hello, everybody. We have some visitors from out of district. I just wanted to uh, bring them in and show them. Mr. Stillman, how are you, sir? You guys can come on in. It's okay. Because we're staying here for this place. She's in here. It's very so. It works out beautifully. It's like a clown car. Yeah, it's, <laughs> it's enormous, so everybody. Would you like to sit? <laughs> um, this is Mr. Sobo. He's one of our social studies teachers. He has been one of our pioneers with using the Blackboard system and getting a lot of material online. Uh, he's going to give a brief overview of how we've used the technology in the class, and then if there's time, we can ask the students some questions. And then we'll be staying here for the next class to come in, so we don't have to travel with the bell. Okay. It's a good thing our lecture just ended, guys. Um, well, I'll let you know, I'll let them talk. Um, you know, so I'll, I have to turn off my video recorders first. Hey, um, you took 